My name is El Dorado Fleetwood Cadillac Brown. Today we are in the east central side of Spokane at Liberty Park, celebrating my release, celebrating the day that I did nine years plus in prison, and today's my first day out. process right now. This is what's going to happen, Mr. What Parker. about my meds and the medical we're equipment? Gonna have, I was promised. We're going to have the officer go through the process with you. you okay. Can ask that question, okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. From what I understand, they're going to give me a um, bus ticket, they're gonna give me a housing voucher, and they're gonna give me the phone card, and um, I'll be taken to Pasco, Washington, and from Pasco, I board a bus that'll take me to Seattle. Today's a lockdown day, so that means I'll be stuck inside of a cell about as big as the room that I'm in now, maybe a little bit bigger because of a bed, for the whole day without being able to, uh, to come out or shower or use the phone or anything like that. It's like uh, solitary confinement, basically. They don't understand that placing me in the hole exacerbates my mental illness to a whole different degree. My name is Anna Guy, and I'm a staff attorney with Disability Rights Washington on the AVID Prison Project, which stands for Amplifying Voices of Inmates with Disabilities. We set out to determine whether or not there were barriers to reentry specific to people with disabilities, and El Dorado Brown is one of the three people that we followed through the reentry process. Most prisoners face reentry at some point uh, once they've completed their prison sentence, and Knowing that reentry is difficult for everyone, the AVID Prison Project felt that it was likely that it was more difficult for people with disabilities, um, just due to some of the challenges that people with disabilities face with respect to find getting accommodations and accessing the services they might need. Let's start really easy. Um, what can you tell me your name and where we are today? Kara Moser, and I'm at WCCW. I had neurosurgery because I had avian brain tumors, and once I got out, a doctor gave me an MRI, and I was diagnosed with bilateral hip surgery. I've had my hip replaced here. So I was in the hospital for I don't even know how long, because the people that are around, weren't, those people that were around me then, aren't around me now. <laughs> I'm sorry, nobody's okay. really talked to me like ever cared about really what's going on, you know? Kara has uh, re reported to have an, a number of disabilities, and I think that uh, it was challenging for Kara. I think she, she had a lot of a hard time in prison. I think that it's hard for people who don't have experience with people with disabilities to be compassionate and be patient and really see the underlying issue and, and not just address the immediate emotion that's being expressed. My name is Tyrone Gathens and we're in Coyote Ridge Correctional Facility which is located in Carnell, Washington. I have a vision disability. I was diagnosed with retinitis pigmentosis, um, RP. I was diagnosed with this back in 1979. I do have some vision, but my vision has gradually been taken away. Now, okay, let's stay here. When I first got here to Coyote Ridge, it, it was a challenge for me. I used to go in other units because <laughs> I would get lost, you know? I mean, I would go inside other people's cells because I would get lost. You want to see the cell? This is my cell right here. I spend a lot of my time in my cell because it's really hard, especially for somebody with a, a vision disability. You know, me not being able to see my daughter or me not being able to communicate with family, friends, or loved ones as I once did, it created a sense of severe depression that that led me to find a release. I needed to find a release. Doctors say that I suffer from non-suicidal self-injury, NSSI. 
And that means that I like to cut on myself without the thought of suicide. And I engage in self-harm without the intentions of actually dying. A lot of people in this situation feel like they have no voice. They feel like they have nobody that would actually understand them, whether you're incarcerated or you're in segregation. In here, I'm locked down 23 hours, but they consider it for my safety because if you have any kind of suicidal background, which I do, I have five suicide attempts, right? And um, yeah, I've gone through it. Do, do they give you counseling for the suicide? No. Mm -mm. I never thought of that. Um, I mean, prison is like not that hands-on. I mean, this is punishment. We talk about prison as being this, it's for punishment, uh, but also there's an expectation that people are being rehabilitated. And the prison has some responsibility over the services the person receives both in the prison and making those connections out in the community to make sure that they're successful and they get the tools they need to find jobs and housing and be productive members and safe members of our community. No one's here has really, um done anything to help me get something on concrete as far as my transition back out into the community. They haven't decided where they want to send me. They don't know if they're going to send me to Cowage County, Pierce County, or King County. And I'm real familiarized with the Pierce County area and the King County area. I know my way around. I use the bus service there. I know not only my mental health doctors, but my normal physical doctors. You know, I know where their office is. I know how to ride the, the bus, the public bus service and get there. I don't know anything about that in Cowage County. When inmates release, generally the department requires, it's a requirement that inmates release to their county of origin, which is where they committed their first offense. That's sort of the first hurdle that people have to get through, is figuring out what they have to support them in that county of origin. I have 62 criminal charges out of Spokane County before I was 21. I was involved in a lot of street life activity, a lot of negativity, a lot of the drug gang, a lot of gangs. I asked them to change out of Spokane County to Snohomish County to be able to better adjust. My mom died, my dad's dead. There's nothing in Spokane but family members that smoke crack cocaine. One of the other elements of reentry is setting up the supports and services that a person needs once they're on the outside so that they can be successful. And that's where work release really could come into play. Work release is when you go and you, um, it's still considered a, a prison facility and you're able to go work but you report back in and you know, you're theirs, right, for a while you're there. And then um, you're able to save up a little bit of money, they take a percentage I asked to go to work release. In my county, it's uh, Radcliffe. And I did, I've only been there once, but I did really well there. And um, they said no. Everybody who I arrived here with on the chain bus, they're all employed, all of them. If I had my ability to do things as a normal person would, I would have been to work release. If I was at work release right now, I would be I would be going over to the Vocational Rehab Center for the Blind. I would reconnect with the various resources I have out there. That little buffer before the streets, that really helps. They sent my information in and the work releases have denied me. You know, I'm kind of like um, in a bad situation right now. I made it 22 days last time, so I mean, 30 days would be better. You know, if I can make it 30 days this time, I think that, that that'll be a goal. That's not what we want people's reentry success to be. Um, that's not what we're striving for. Good morning. We have uh, the camera crew here. Look, I still, I still haven't gotten my meds. I still haven't gotten my meds from medical. You're here really early. I'm leaving. I've been nervous about that because I was supposed to leave on 316 and that didn't happen. So today's 4-9. I'm supposed to be being released and that I explained my parole officer is coming. 
I don't, they won't tell you who she is or, or he or what office they're with. I am headed to uh, mm -hmm. Kent, Washington to this aha, clean and sober place. I wanted to live in North Seattle, where's my hospital, my um, physical therapy. I've had none here. And it don't change. Yeah, yeah it shoes. looks like it. This is as good as it's good. So do you have some um, shoes that you're going to be wearing? These, oh, shoot. I feel really overwhelmed, like, I know, I hate using that word, it's like so overkill. Um, I haven't been free in over 24, it's 24 months for this whole time. Hi, Eldorado. So is it okay if we, um, if I put you on speaker and we record? Right now. They have me in like total confinement. I'm in, a, I'm in a place that is worse than INU or worse than Max custody. They're not allowing me to have anything. They're not allowing me to contact anybody that, that I need to contact to uh, prepare for the streets. And I'm supposed to be in general population. I said, I can go anywhere. Send me to the West complex. Send me to the South complex. Send me to the East complex. You can send me to the bar units or you can send me to protective custody unit. I'm 12 days away from going home. Send me anywhere you want to in general population because I need to adjust back to society and I need to be able to be around people. The records indicate that DOC did try to move him back to the bar unit, but El Dorado was indicating that he would self-harm if he was moved back to the bar unit. But I think it's worth noting that uh, he was just days away from his re-entry and there had been a lot of changes that took place in the days leading up to his reentry. He was transferred across the state to a different facility. His county of origin exception requests were denied. You know, he was lined up to be living in one place and that fell through kind of at the last minute. I think what you're hearing is, is panic. He's, he's been in for a decade and he's getting out in 12 days. There's a, a delay in my release plan. Um, I was wanting to return back to the home where I left prior to coming in here. And right now it's under construction. I'm aware of that and I don't see myself being hurt there or anything. You know, I know what's going on. However, the probation people, when they went out there, they've been out there three, maybe four times now. And each time they go out there, they have another excuse as to why I can't go there. The last reason they said because there was no toilet tissue dispenser. Since that time, I've spoken with my counselor, a good guy, Mr. Harmon. He placed me into this program. It's called the housing voucher program. I was attempting to try to get somewhere in the area which I know, which is North Seattle. Unfortunately, there was nothing available in that area, so he submitted me for West Seattle, and it's a two-bedroom house. I don't know how I'm gonna get the keys or get inside and things of that nature, but there's only gonna be two people residing there, myself and this other person, who I don't know that who that person is yet. I need um, the stuff, my hygiene. I have no hygiene to take home with. I literally have nothing to go home with. Bang. I'm still getting kind of burnt because of the conditions of my release. Like, I'm not able to go live where I want to. Like, you have to be told where you're going to live. And I don't know how long I have to live there. So I don't know how long I'm going to go with no money. No money. The $40 gate thing, I got to get ID. I don't have food stamps. None of the stuff has been prepared. So there's no pre-release plan here or nobody knows about if it exists or not. So even though I've been trying to work on this since you guys sent me the paperwork six months ago, nothing's happened. Even though I filled out DSHS paperwork three different times, nothing's happened. It's a miracle to me that anybody does get released. I think at the very least I expected inmates, just the, the, the folks in our video, to have a more clear understanding of what was happening, even if it wasn't what they wanted or it wasn't happening in the time frame that they wanted it to happen in or it wasn't the housing facility that they wanted to go to or it wasn't the county that they wanted to go to, even if everything was sort of at odds, I expected them to know that. And what they were telling me was that they didn't know that and that they weren't getting answers or that the answers were that the staff they were asking didn't know or they were getting conflicting information. And 
um, if if nothing else, that's problematic. I am currently in an isolated mental health, whatever they call this area of the hospital that I'm in, and I haven't seen anybody or talked to anybody or heard anything about anything about my release. I don't even know where I'm going or anything. Um, they haven't contacted me. They haven't told me anything. Uh, I, I don't really see who is available or who what the plan is. Yeah. I'm just really excited about this day finally making it. I'm going to see if I can find somebody to help me get to a, um, a bus stop where I can go to the house. Yeah. Either there or I want to go to the Social Security office so I can get my benefits reactivated. We know that you know people who have disabilities are often on um, public assistance of some kind or government benefits, social security benefits, uh, and that's another factor that we were thinking about when we were like, thinking about reentry uh, was whether people were getting connected to those benefits before they were released. I got a lot of worries now, you know. Once I get my bearings down, I'll be able to hopefully get around without any assistance. But I think it's going to be okay. I got patience and I know the Lord is with me too, you know, right beside me, got my back and everything. So I, f I feel confident that I'm going to get this thing completed. Would you like a cane or a They're going to give me a cane or a walker. I have to what choose would you between prefer? one. What's been most helpful for you, a walker or a cane? Yeah, the walker is like when I get to stairs, then I have to... That's what I'm trying Period to say. Up. That's what I'm trying to say. If you're going up and down steps, Walker isn't going to. I don't. Never seen this house. I have no idea. Of course. Good morning, Miss Mosier. I know. No, I, I got oh. that. Yeah, I got her state issue. She had some glasses. Okay. Okay. So I'm gonna have you sign there for me. That's your Social Security card. And I can't go home for now. Thirty-two months on probation. Okay, Miss Mosier, go ahead and turn and look out the window. Full body. Oh, sorry. Yeah. It's okay. It's fine. I know, I just... It's okay, it's okay. Take a slow deep breath for me, Miss Moser, okay? I'm so afraid of you guys. I mean, I'm going to be on DOC for three, two months. I'm really scared I'm going to do something wrong. Okay, and... it's Miss Moser, come over here for me, okay? Come up here. I didn't have any idea what was going to transpire today. All I knew was that I was leaving. They said I'm signed up for Obamacare. Then they gave me a bus pass. Then they gave me an apartment. So, so I gotta buy that? That's what no. I'm trying to tell you. You're gonna need some stuff. Can you talk a little bit more about the apartment? Did, so you didn't know about that ahead of time? I found out when you found out. I didn't find out anything. They told me when they told you. Here's your new ID. Okay. Does it have sight impaired on here? Because no. on my ID it has sight impaired. Here's your $40 gate money. All right. Okay. Here is a check for $20.50. Okay. Here is your bank statement with your account closed out. All right. Okay. Okay. And then you're ready? I'm ready. All right. Let's go. I was ready last Now week. there's no turning back. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> Okay, well, it's not a walker, but... That'll do. Uh, they said they'd give me a walker, sir. I thought you want a, you want a walker. I'm, I'm going to talk to you about that. Okay. This is Miss Moser. She's releasing. I was like, this is my Dr. Coulter. It's amazing. Okay. You know you have an appointment? No, nobody Barbara, told me. You, okay. Barbara, do you mean you don't? You, well, you don't. Okay. Do you? No, but thank I you. Need, do you have an address you can give me and I'll mail you the information? Okay. It's a whole bunch of numbers on 121st Street Avenue. So you don't know the Southeast. address? Not without. I had brain surgery. I can't remember anything. Okay. okay. All right. Well, we'll try and get it for you. Okay, I'm sorry I didn't you. get that to you before. 
today. All right, good luck. Yeah, it's Take soon, care. I hope. Thank All you. Right. As Kara is leaving, uh, she runs into a medical provider who says something to the effect of, like, oh, did you know about this, this appointment that we have scheduled for you or we have an appointment scheduled for you? So if she hadn't run into that person in that moment, that appointment was lost. What time is it? Ele oh, it's almost noon. 11.54. What would you be doing right now if you weren't with us? If you were at Walla, Walla? Oh man, probably kicking on my door, yelling at the police, having a mental health breakdown. No. Um, if I was at Walla Walla right now, I'd probably be eating lunch. The double bacon cheeseburger combo. What do you guys get for here? Every single time I've been in this neighborhood or every time that I've been in this store, I've always been doing a deal or I've always been doing something negative. All this way from prison. Oh, they got the bacon sticking out of the thing. Yeah, man. Well, nine years gone. <laughs> it's crazy because I haven't ran into nobody that knows me yet, which is good. Oh, so I'm going to drop this off over at the Binding Company and walk the rest of the way over to the, to the federal building. Then I'm gonna try to get over to the uh, Department of Health and Social Services and see if maybe uh, I can get me some assistance, some food stamps and things of that nature. I'm Kara. And we're going by and I'm like going, oh, I really like that girl's outfit because oh, like having you. clothes. Listen, these, this is disability rights because I went through some stuff. No, that's okay. Anthony, uh, the manager, he's coming out here in a second. Hello. Hi, you look familiar to me. Hi, I'm Kara. Oh, hi. You look familiar to me. Hi, I've seen you in the movies. <laughs> <laughs> your room's back there. We put all your property up there. Yeah. It's all on your bed. Nice. Thank you. And he'll show you where your room's nice. at. Thank you. <laughs> I will see you Wednesday the 50th. Take care. Okay, you too. All right. Nice to meet you. Take care, Ms. Wilder. Yeah, you too. I'm, yeah, I mean, I could cry. He's so happy. He's so happy. We're at oh, that apartment right there. This is where I got arrested at, March 20th, 2006. That's where I got arrested at. This is crazy. You got people just posting in the middle of the street. Take a left right here. From right here, from Sprague and Altima, down to Sprague and Perry, is prostitution central, is drug central, is where gangs and the nightlife come from. There's more things to life than living inside of a place like this. It's time to really do something different. I'm at my probation office in West Seattle. I was instructed to live inside housings for prisoners, and I had some problems in there. Um, I didn't like the place, it was real filthy. I mean, as soon as you walk into this door, you can just smell the stench of urine. People were still in my T-shirts and socks and some hygiene products. And I explained that to my CCO officer, and she said I had to stay there for at least 30 days. I didn't do that. I went to the house that they had originally said I couldn't go to. 
In Washington State, we have what's called community supervision, and people get assigned a community corrections officer, which is like your probation officer. And uh, so there are certain rules that you have to follow when you're on community supervision. Tyrone didn't follow all the rules. He turned himself in, but he was still violated. More than likely, they probably arrest me, you know, because I didn't show up for, um, I didn't report. But I've been, you know, doing phone calls with her, and I got some documents in my in my briefcase because I was sick and the doctor been giving me notice of absence. Like I said, I, I feel pretty positive about it. I don't think, she, you know, she's going to slam the book on me, you know. Hello? Hi, can I speak to Kara Moser, please? Uh, she's not here right now. Okay, do you know when she might return? No, uh, I, I don't even think she'll be staying here any longer. Oh, I see. Um, did she move out? No, nah, uh, she wasn't following the rules. We asked her to come back on time, and she still, didn't, she still hasn't been back. So, oh. like, she left and just never, you know. Just imagine that you had your life set up, and all of a sudden you walk out to nothing. I mean, it's almost like homelessness. I mean, you're in a house where nobody likes you because you're old, you take up extra space, you're slower. And there was definitely no bar or anything in the shower. They didn't even like the clomping of my cane. No, nobody else went to meetings, AA meetings. I'm required to, and like, you know, really if you're, it's called working a program, right? Staying, it's not just not drinking, it's like recovery, working the steps. So I've had to fight to get everything that I've gotten since then. Things that seem small, I think, maybe, to other people, like getting a bus pass, you know, a couple of dollars for a bus ride, um, you know, accessing housing, having to buy a mattress. There's a lot to be done. You think about all the things in your daily life that you take for granted. It's like, what do I do first? I, 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 I need, is it medical? Is it housing? Is it, you know, is it getting to my quarter and stuff? Is it getting a free phone? Is it, oh, I'm gonna need stuff. When I move, like even to get a room, I'm gonna need sheets and a towel. Do I, whoa, whoa. I mean, sometimes I'll be just like sitting there going, literally at a bus stop somewhere, and at least I know this neighborhood going, should I go that way or go that? If I go that way, I go, you know, just the feeling of hopelessness, of you know what, I just might as well stay, because they're gonna get me back anyway. This is a lose-lose proposition. Hey, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm uh, camp custody and all that, how come I'm, is this because, it's, how come I'm being handcuffed like this? Quick question for you. Well, when I first well, when I first got out and I went up to my apartment, I was kind of excited. I, I looked around like, okay, this is something that can work. This is something, you know, it's something feasible. But then again, like I said, everybody knows me. I really wanted him to be successful, and uh, I felt personally invested in his success. But I don't know that I was necessarily surprised, given the fact that he tried so hard not to release to that county in particular. I was too entrapped with the nightlife. I was too busy trying to get my, my reputation back, because everybody knows me, El Dorado, and sidetracked my overall objective. Can you talk a little bit about what happened? I chewed on it. When I first come in, they said I'm on custody lock. So that means Friday and Saturdays, I don't move at all. So that means from Friday morning at eight in the morning until Monday morning at eight in the morning, I'm locked in my cell. So that's, that's 24, 48, 72 hours of solitary confinement, no movement, no nothing. So I'm like, man, so I'm like, this drives me crazy. I can't deal with it. So what, what made you feel like that? Stress, not being able to uh, communicate. Say just because I came back, I get no help, no one to talk to. As you last remember on the 10th, which was a Wednesday of last week, I was going to turn myself in. Yeah. Once I got on the other side of that door, they took my stuff, they handcuffed me, and they shot me out the back door into a waiting vehicle and brought me to this 
grand finale over here. At a certain hour at night, they turn the lights out. So what little vision I do have, I have even less vision then. And they place me on the top bunk and there's no ladder or nothing. And that really, that really concerned me. You know, I had a panic attack and I couldn't see how to get down. I requested numerous times to be moved from off the top bunk. You know, I told him, I said, man, I don't feel comfortable up there. You know, and I feel that it's gonna be an accident. One officer said to another officer, well, you sound as though you're gonna hurt yourself. I said, no, I sound as though I'm gonna protect myself from getting hurt. So you can interpret that any way you want, but I'm not getting back up on that bunk. You know, and he told me to turn around and he handcuffed me and they brought me to this area here and gave me the smock. I want to say it's a place for mental illness. As you can hear all the various combatant stuff going on out there in the background, but I'm wearing like some type of smock. They don't allow you to have uh, regular clothing because uh, I'm on some type of suicide watch. And as you know, I'm the most enjoyable person it is out there. Uh, I'm a fun person kind person, love animals, you know, and for me to be like this, um, degraded like this is really bad. It's really bad on my mental. People don't understand, A, how easy it is to become an offender, and B, how much easier it is to violate. You know, that's why girls come back so many times. You think, oh, they're out there committing crimes. No, most of it is violating probation. It's like being on the bottom rung of the ladder. You gotta have to, you know what I mean? Climb over a few people to finally get where you wanna be. But I'm only, I've only been out since April. So hopefully it'll get better. When we started this project, we set out to find specific problems and identify specific challenges and specific barriers that are unique to people with disabilities re-entering. And we think that disability plays a factor in maybe the lack of success that some of the inmates that we followed experienced, but whether they were shortfalls with DOC or shortfalls in the community, El Dorado and Tyrone went back into the correctional system almost immediately and we lost touch with Kara almost immediately, who appeared to, at the time of, of our communication cutoff, was not doing particularly well. The three folks that we followed through their transition into the community weren't successful. What we've taken out of this is that what we have set up isn't working. We don't want people coming back to prison. We don't want people with disabilities going back to prison where we know that it's harder for them than for other people. Um, we need to make the system better. 